14th, 2021. This is the Arlington County, Virginia Board of Equalization hearings. We have five cases on the agenda. The first case is RPC 2300711G on South Oakland Street. We have Ms. Suzanne Ross for the owner and Lori Roskin is representing the county. Uh, Mr. Lawson has a conflict on this and will not be participating in the case. So it'll just be the six of us. So Ms. Ross, you can start with your eight minutes and tell us about the property. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 46 South Glebe is a mixed use office retail property. It was built in 1950 and the office addition was built in 1987. It contains 25,000 square feet. 68% uh, of the property is office space and 32% is retail space. What we've asked the county to do is to value the property as two distinct elements utilizing their guidelines. Um, for the office portion, if you turn to page four, you can see that the gross potential income is based on actual leases in place that were provided on the rent roll. Um, the average rents received were $25.76, including the vacant space, which is unit 101. Um, on the office side, one tenant, Lucy Hawkins, only paid half their rents in 2020. Um, as far as vacancy expense and cap rate, we use the Arlington guidelines for offices and that analysis is on page five uh, developed that so we use vacancy of 20 percent expense rate of 1150 and a cap rate of 8.295 which developed a value for the office space of two million one hundred thirteen thousand one hundred um, then if you turn to the retail portion it's on page five again the gross potential based on the actual leases in place um, the average rental rates uh, received were thirty one dollars and nine cents this property had a lot of COVID abatements um, in the amount of $18,895. Uh, Samaris Hair Salon uh, received abatements for May and June of 2020 in the amount of $2,886. And Sally Beauty Supply received abatements for four months from April to June in the amount of $3,281. Uh, page six, again, used the Arlington guidelines for retail space with a vacancy of 4% expenses at 13% and a cap rate of 7.3, which developed the value of 2,772,300. Uh, again, the subjects and office retail mixed use property that was affected by the clo closings that occurred in 2020 due to COVID. Um, we just asked that the county consider the rental abatements. The total adding the retail and office space together, uh, we are requesting a value of 4,885,700. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Roskin for the county, please. And thank you, board members and uh, Ms. Ross. Uh, first of all, this is uh, this property is considered uh, 219, which is mixed office commercial. The PCC is 219. And that those that particular property class code falls under the general commercial guidelines. And uh, we don't use a, a, a mix of uh, of uh, the large office guidelines with the general commercial. We actually develop uh, this particular property class by itself. Um, as for the COVID abatements, if you take a look at the rent analysis on page six, you will note that I have um, made, uh, made a note of the COVID abatements and they actually came to a total of 29,500. Um, also note on this page, you'll see what the average <clears throat> uh, retail rent, which came to $32.90 a square foot, and then the average office rent was $27.60. Taking that information and going to um, <clears throat> the test page, what we did is uh, we looked at the average rent and I looked at the COVID abatements and I discounted that rent by a dollar and 18 cents across the board. Uh, and that's what you're, that's the result that you're seeing in column F for the test. However, uh, let's go back to column D, which is the original assessment. When I valued this property um, at the end of the year last year, we knew that there was going to be, we did receive a, a COVID um, INE. And so we knew there were going to be issues with this property. Um, 
for 2020. So I had that in mind. And when you take a look at the uh, bottom line for uh, column D, our, our NOI that we came up with, it is much less than what they're reporting um, for the 2020. Now, if you take a look, there's two columns, if you've noticed, for the 2020 um, INE. The first one is what the owner submitted. And I noticed that something didn't look right uh, when they're when they're stating that they had abatements and, and such and they weren't reporting it. And I also looked at the uh, reported revenue. And so um, we had some conversation back and forth in email and we got some corrections made. And so the column E2 shows those corrections in the reported revenue and, and the email is attached to this case. But when you look at the NOI that's being reported for either one of those columns and you compare it to the NOI, our NOI for the original January 1 assessment, we are still substantially less. And that is why column F is a test only and not a revision. So we're asking the board to uh, consider the original assessed value. I'm finished, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, questions from board members? Mr. Matzkin. So for the department, um, you had mentioned that this is a special classification. <clears throat> Is that why you don't break out retail from office because they have different cap rates uh, in other yeah. cases? So when I analyze, when I analyze, so first of all, in, in the property class code 219, you can have office flip back and forth to retail, okay? So we have a separate category for this, 219, which is mixed office commercial. And we find sometimes that those spaces will flip back and forth, okay? So we have a, a specific category for that. And we develop the guidelines. Our guidelines are based on all of those similar property types. So we don't use a separate cap rate for the office or the retail. It's the general commercial cap rate of 7.3%. Thank you. Okay, other questions? No. Okay, Ms. Roskin, do you have anything else to tell us? Um, just that right before I filed the appeal, I received their income and expense that they sent to the county. I mean, you can even look at on um, Lori's. Okay, I'm, gonna, gonna, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you because you get the final say. So, Ms. Roskin, if you want to say something this way, you can rebut anything that she has to say. My okay, apologies. Okay. No, no problem. All right, Ms. Roskin. No problem, no problem. So once again, I just want you to take a look at the original assessment in comparison to what's being submitted. And uh, across the board, it's lower than 2019. The NOI is lower than 2019 and the 2020 assessment. And even after consideration of the abatements and, and calculating those in the test worksheet, our original assessment is still lower than what they're showing. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. And now Ms. Ross, you can have the final say on this. Uh, okay, thank you. I, I was just gonna say that they gave me their internal income and expense statement, which is totally different than what is showing, which they probably did file to the county. Uh, if you look on Lori's page, um, her, her test page, there's something off. How could somebody go from two eight, NOI of 218 to 357 to 528? I, I just think they filled out the 2019 income and expense statement incorrectly, unfortunately. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, it's just among the board members. What's everybody think? Mr. Hoffman. Um, I mean, it's not a it's not a class A trophy office building at all, but it's got it's got pretty good income and and occupancy historically. Um, I, 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 nothing's really shocking me as this being an overassessed property. Yeah, others. Mr. Matzkin. 
think this is reasonably consistent with what we've been seeing with office buildings, namely just a flat line. Um, you know, if the center turns flat line a uh, little bit below, a little bit above. Um, they've had some abatements, but they haven't had massive uh, vacancies. Um, and that's when, of course, office buildings fall below. So this, this seems consistent with everything that we've seen this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, the, to the last point that the uh, Miss Ross made about that they filled it out wrong, I I guess possibly if they didn't have the 2019 number in there, I would look and say, okay, maybe, but it seems like it's more consistent with 2019. And if that was the case, I mean, there was more than enough time, you know, to present to the county adjusted number. So I've got to go with what was reported there. And I agree with both Mr. Hoffman and Mr. Maskin. I don't find that it's over assessed based on what we know. Mr. Panaranda? Uh, yeah, I agree. I think the assessment is uh, generous compared to what we've seen in many cases. Uh, and to split the cap rates between office and commercial in this particular property, I don't think it would be equalized with other right. properties that we have seen in the county. So, you know, this is not the only one that is being treated that way. So I'm OK with it. I think the original assessment is more than generous. OK. All right. Anybody contrary, Mr. Yates? No, I'm not contrary. I just, yeah, the expenses are more than reasonable. Uh, GPI's in line. I didn't see anything at all that made me question it. OK. All right, then I will move to confirm the county at 6,682,400. Mr. Metzkin is a second. Um, motion a second. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Mr. Yates, that was an aye, correct? Yes. Okay. So that's six to zero um, with um, Mr. Lawson abstaining. Um, the county's confirmed at 6,682,400. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Board. Have Thank you, Board. Thank you, Suzanne. Take care. Okay. The second case is RPC 34024266. The property located at 1225 South Clark Street. I understand that they've accepted the offer from the county and the county has the document signed. So I assume there's no objection from the county, Mr. Peralta? No. Okay. All right. Then I will move to with accept the withdrawal since it's already done. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Mr. Penaround is a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous. And then just to keep on the same track, the last RPC 34026035 at 1999 Richmond Highway, I believe, is the same. Do we have the letter on that? We do not have a letter on it, but we do agree with the county's valuation. All right. Is there any objection from the county to accept the number? No, ma'am. Okay. No objection. All right, so, so again, I'll move to withdrawal. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, no. <coughs> is the second all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No, okay, so that's unanimous of the withdrawal on that one. Okay. Thank you, board members. So that certainly moves the agenda along there. Thank you, Mr. Chicas. He's excused, and so we're back to Mr. Peralta. Um, the next case on the agenda is RPC 16039036, the property located at 1621 South Kent Street. Um, and Mr. Harmon is on and he's going to present for the county. So Mr. Harmon, you can start with your eight minutes and tell us about this property. Very good, Madam Chairwoman, members of the board, good morning. This is 1621 North Kent Street. This is at the easternmost edge of Roslyn. It's on North Kent between Wilson Boulevard and 19th Street North. This property was built in 1966. It was assigned an effective age of 1973. This property, if you're familiar with this edge of Ros Roslyn, this is near the heart of Roslyn, but when you go down to Kent Street, it's, it's cut off from Roslyn. There's no through uh, pedestrian walkway to get onto the other side to get to Lynn and get to the Roslyn Metro. You have to go around the block. So when you go to this property, it's it feels distant from Roslyn. 
you couple this with the high vacancy at the subject as well as the surrounding buildings and really it's just an eerie sense when you go down there i was down there this past week and it it's just it, it feels isolated uh, the property also doesn't have modern amenities as of the date of value january 1st 2021 the owner would require a large tenant to redevelop <clears throat> this property for it to make economic sense Vacancy at this property has been 48%, 51%, and 59% over the past three years. An additional 6.1% is set to expire in 2021, and there are no new leases or expansions executed in 2020. Now, if you'd be so kind as to turn your attention to page five of the appeal pack, this is the county's test page. You'll notice on the county's test that the NOI has declined, or I'm sorry, not on the county's test, but on, on the uh, page five, you'll notice that NOI has declined each year from 2017 to 2020, where it's dropped 35% over this time frame. Please note that the assessment's 2021 NOI is also more than double the actual 2020 NOI reported at the property. For this case, the county used the income approach to value. We did a similar income approach. However, we would like to modify what you see on this page five. In our column G, we would like uh, to update our cap rate to reflect the county's cap rate and adjust the rent loss period from two years, as is currently stated, down to one year. This results in an upward adjustment of our claim value, which is now at 19 million six hundred forty one to thousand eight hundred dollars you'll see that the main issues in this case are the vacant office rental rate and the operating expenses for the vacant office rental rate the most recent leases at this property are from 2019 the county used two of the 2019 leases however there was a third 2019 lease that was not included uh, this is i assume because the 2019 lease that was not included did default in 2020 and is not listed on the year in 2020 rent roll. It is listed on page 109 of the appeal pack. That's the 2019 INE rent roll. So this information was available. Uh, we believe the market as of January 1st, 2021 is not better than it was when these leases were signed in 2019. And any new lease in as of the date of value would be below these 2019 leases. Uh, the county from Q4 2018 to Q4 2019 saw office rental rates increase by just over 2%. However, the following year from Q4 2019 to Q4 2020, office rental rates in the county declined by just over 3%. Uh, the net effect of these changes is that rental rates decreased. Now, if we go back to the three 2019 leases, the net effective rent of these leases was $30.43 per square foot, which included 8% in concessions. We use $30 per square foot in our appeal based on these 2019 leases and the understanding that the market in 2021 is below where it was at the time these leases were signed. In addition to the 2019 leases, our claimed vacant office rental rate is supported by the lease for the penthouse of this building which was at $36.54 per square foot as of the date of value. Now this is the penthouse is on the 12th floor of this building. The majority of the vacant office space is on floors two through five, which of course do not have the penthouse views or do have some views that are obstructed by buildings more. And these floors will command lower rental rates than the penthouse. The vacant space is being advertised at $36.50 per square foot, but this again is what the penthouse currently leases for and is not likely where new leases will land. Given the fact that vacancy has increased over the last four years and is set to increase again in 2021, it's clear that these lower floors are going to command a much lower rental rate than both the penthouse and the advertised rate. So to reiterate, this building was constructed in 1966, 55 years ago, and has not undergone a major renovation. The effective age year is 1973. Given the slowdown in leasing velocity in Arlington, this property is likely not going to be one of the first buildings to lease up. The layout of the floors is outdated. The aesthetic is not modern. 
Uh, there's no floor to ceiling windows. Column spacing is closer than many tenants desire. And additionally, again, this, this part of Roslyn is isolated from really the beating heart of Roslyn and it feels cold. The next, I'd like to discuss the operating expenses. The operating expenses at the property have averaged $8.99 per square foot over the past four years. This is, of course, at a building that has been an average of 45% vacant over that time frame. And again, if we, we are to assume a stabilized income stream, we must also assume a stabilized expense stream. The variable cost will increase as occupancy increases to 75% stabilization. Three of these variable costs alone, electricity, janitorial, and the management fee, those together would add $2.32 per square foot to the operating expense rate if we are to assume 75% stabilized occupancy. Additionally, the 2020 occupancy was of course lower due to COVID work from home policies, which skewed the 2020 operating expenses lower. To summarize, the assessment assumes a vacant office space rental rate above what the property is likely to be able to achieve and assumes an expense rate that is below what the property is likely to incur at stabilized occupancy. This property has suffered chronic vacancy of 48 to 57% over the past three years. The NOI has declined each year since 2017 and was down 35% from 2017 in 2020. Finally, the 2020 actual NOI reported at the property was half of what the 2021 assessment imputes. Thank you, and Eileen, would you like to add anything? No, I think you covered everything. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Peralta for the county, please. Yes, thank you, board. Um, for this property, this property is actually part of a phased development site plan uh, 422. And this is the first case that to be heard before the BOE, but um, I believe the, the agent has appealed all the cases um, that are part of this PDSP, which the board will hear at a later time, unfortunately. Um, due to scheduling, we would like or prefer to have all these scheduled at the same time, but uh, with it being, I think I have a little more than <laughs> 30 seconds. Um, when it's okay. Uh, when we're looking at this property, um, I'd like to note that in years 2018, 2019, 2020, the uh, owners have reported actual income. Um, if you refer to any of the income and expense forms that are uh, provided in this packet, you'll see that actual income was reported not at 100% occupancy for um, the INEs that you know, was reported for these 2018 to 2020 years. So at first glance, uh, the board would see that the gross potential for this property is maybe at 50% of what our test column F is showing, or 40, maybe about 46% of what the appellant is showing as the gross potential. So I just wanted to point that out to make you understand that this isn't what the department is asking the owners to provide. We're asking for a gross potential for the property so we can compare apples to apples when uh, looking at the test or the original assessment. So when looking at this property, we do see that there was an increase in vacancy uh, when we, from what we initially saw uh, when we did the original 2021 assessment. Uh, upon review, we did change and increase the vacancy square foot to match exactly what the appellant's pro forma is saying. Um, we do differ in the amount of uh, per square foot rate that we use for the current lease spaces and the vacant spaces. Um, so I'd like to get into that. Um, it's pretty straightforward as far as the department is concerned. Uh, we take all the leases that are currently in the property and we find out uh, exactly what the average rent for those spaces are. Uh, we deduct the normal 6% across the board with all properties in Arlington. Um, and that 6% is derived from the, the publications we've seen. And actually uh, I've taken it a step further in the most recent years and taken exactly what the owners have provided me as far as their leasing concessions and broke it down on a month to month basis 
and the six percent is you know what we've seen in the market now if that should change in the future then that is definitely um, something that we would change and we apply across the board so we're looking at um, the 2019 leases um, again these are the most current leases that we have in the property the actual information that was provided to us and so we did look at that and and we did use that rate uh, minus the six percent of course so if you refer if you need to refer to our page seven of 122 it, it further breaks that down and it shows you exactly what i've used um, i did see that the asking rents were higher than what i used in the, in the uh, test column and so we we did opt to to use the lower rent when projecting for that vacant space uh, for this property <clears throat> in Going down further, we did um, keep vacancy at 25%. What we had originally in the uh, 21 assessment, we did keep the expenses the same as we had in the original assessment. We did see a dip in the expenses uh, reported for the 2020 uh, income and expense year for the subject property. But looking at the, the past years, you'll see, and I'll note, in columns A, B, and C, we did deduct the leasing commissions uh, from each of these expense years because um, you know those expenses should be removed. Um, and so we come up with a rate of about, um, you'll see there in my column F. <clears throat> um, I don't think I have anything. Oh, I did state that um, the ASCII rents are the you know, the rate that I indicated there in my comment section, uh, comment number three, and, you know, that would yield a, a higher per square foot rent than we're using in our test. Um, so with that, um, was there anything else you'd like to add, Irving? I think there was a comment made about the expenses that we use. Um, you explained to the board that we removed at least some commissions based off of explanation already given several times when we have office cases about equal treatment of expenses when you analyze a sale for cap rate analysis and when you turn around and value the property for assessment purposes. Uh, one thing also to point out is that we're using a 25% vacancy uh, you will see in 2017, the vacancy was actually uh, around 21% on this property, uh, and the expenses were $9 a square foot. 2018, the vacancy was 22% for this property, and the uh, expenses were $9 a square foot. So the $9.50 that we're applying is appropriate when you're also using a 25% cap rate on this property. Um, and that's all I have to add. I think that should be considered. Um, and that's it. OK, thank you. OK, questions from board members. Mr. Hoffman. Uh, on the site plan that's in the package that it has that was like 2016. Has, has that been approved? Oh, the um, status yes. of the site plan, it, it's still subject to 4.1 approval. And the site plan itself requires that. Um, can you all hear me? I feel like I'm reverberating. You can hear me, okay? I can hear you. Okay. The site plan itself requires that the community benefits be evaluated at the time that the building plans are submitted. So those that site plan and that density has not vested yet. So can I speak to that? Yeah, please. So, so of course this is a PDSP, so PDSPs have a longer duration to actually complete, uh, complete the plan because of the amount of density that's involved. Um, every PDSP has to bring forth an individual site plan for the different projects. So during 2016 county board hearing, the PDSP was approved. The zoning was also changed on this property to Roslyn, CO Roslyn, which is 10 FAR. Uh, one thing also to note about the PDSP, it is a guideline for the development of this property. The total site for this property is over 300 some thousand square feet. They brought forth the request to only use 238,000 square feet because that's what they owned at the time. 
The total density approved was 2.38 million square feet of FAR. Um, after or during the process, there was in the PDSP a condition to buy a VDOT site. And there's also a condition to buy county owned land. That purchase was made for the VDOT spot site. So part of the conditions have been satisfied on this PDSP. The reason the PDSP has so long for um, development again is because of the size of the project. But also during these years, there can be changes due to club studies or um, sector plans, whatever that may affect the different plans that the different projects they're going to bring forth. This property, I believe, is about 1.8 million or, or so square feet of office. There's two, potentially two apartment buildings. There are hotel rooms approved in this PDSP as well. And as we all know, over time, due to the market, they may come back and say, hey, can we amend this PDSP and convert? hotel to apartments or hotels to um, office, which we saw with Penn Place out in Pentagon City, and even recently with Metropolitan Park, which was part of a PDSP approved for apartments, but later converted to office because that's what Amazon wanted to happen for them to buy it. So that's a little bit of background about PDSPs and the reason why you bring forth each plan to the county board for 4.1 approval because you may want to amend it based off the market or just the change in times. Can I address that a little bit further, please? Okay. On page 74 of the appeal package, first off, this is, we are not asking that this property be based on land value. If we were, we would be asking for the original value in our appeal. And that is because the density at the site, again, has not vested. On page 74 of the appeal package, it states that and, um, at number 40, the developer agrees that the density for the phase development site plan is subject to the developer's offering of important community benefits. That means that the density does not exist until those community benefits have both been determined and conveyed. So in this case, once we looked at this property and we used the cap rate that the county used and we used because we know that the board has been um, following that in terms of guidelines and we adjusted the deductions below the line to be a one-year deduction because the board has been again using that as its guideline we um, came up with a value that is greater than and that's the value mr Harmon mentioned is greater than the value of the existing density at the property. Okay, thank you. Other questions from board members? No? Okay. Uh, Mr. Peralta, if you take a minute to wrap up, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, just wanted to clarify, uh, I'm not sure if I heard her correctly, but on page 97 to 122 uh, of the appellant's packet, they said the improvements have no contributory value. Um, so I, I believe Ms. Borman said that they weren't arguing that, but that was what I was presented for this case. Um, when looking at this property, what we didn't mention was that the land for this property was reduced at 60% of what the market is based on uh, what we've seen um, in Arlington. If you look on page um, 21 of 20, 122, you'll have the spreadsheet of the county and the all the parcels that are associated with this PDSP. And so <clears throat> you'll see the remaining value was 40%. Um, and that's what we attributed to this property for the, the land portion. Um, again, uh, going over the merits of this case, I believe that you know the the per square foot rates that we did use are justified and supported. If you look at the uh, the rent roll that was provided, thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Harmon. If you'd like to take a minute to wrap up, sir.
Yes, thank you. So first off, to address some of the vacancy rates that uh, Mr. Bailey mentioned for 2017 and 2018, I did pull up the INEs that correspond with those years, and vacancy was not as low as, as was stated. They In 2017, it was 21%. 2018, it was reported on the INE at 48.2%. So it has been high vacancy and those expense rates will change as as it occupancy increases. Uh, the advertised rate that was mentioned again, you know, that's an aspirational rate. It's not likely to bring that. Um, and the expenses included on the county's test page on page five do not include leasing commissions. So, you know, the discussion of leasing commissions being included in expenses on that page, they're averaging nine dollars. That's without leasing commissions. Um, so that's, you know, further supports the expense rate of 1050. Um, and, and finally, with the site plan, you know, these proper, this property is phase three of that site plan. No work has started on the other phases. Uh, space is being advertised at seven years for lease. Um, so that's, you know, it was valued as an income producing property. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's just among the board members. What's everybody think? Mr. Lawson. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll share a little bit about um, what I know about phase development site plans. Um, my father and myself did um, the phase development site plan for Pentagon City, <clears throat> and I did um, Pentagon Row, which was um, based upon the phase development site plan uh, many, many years after the original phase development site plan went to court and got uh, uh, sustained by the, uh, the, the judiciary. Uh, a phase development site plan sets out density and so forth, uh, subject to a follow up final uh, development, you know, final 4.1. And um, when you go from CO to, which is a 3.8 FAR to seal Roslyn, you know, you're going to a 10 FAR. Now there's formulas the county has used, utilized in the past where you can trade one type of density for another type of density. We had no commercial at Pentagon Road, so we traded residential units for uh, commercial density. That's done all the time and it's recognized in the industry. And so I don't think you can say that the phase development site plan is not vested or it has no impact or whatever. And so what what I guess I'm struggling with slightly is, you know, which direction do we go? Do we go with income or do we go with, you know, the fact it's been up zoned? Um, I don't really know. I guess maybe maybe the way to handle it is is to go with the county's test column recognizing that there is greater value what it is we don't know because it's not we don't have the final 4.1 but we do have the phase development and and so i think the applicant has done a really good job of of pointing out the income and how perhaps that should go down but then overall we still have the phase development site plan which has increased value with that, I'll be quiet and hear what others had. OK, um, Mr. Maskin, I believe, did you have your hand up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with Barnes analysis. I, I think it's it's a close call, but it's too soon. We've seen elsewhere in past years in Roslyn where there were vacant, decrepit buildings that had been up zoned significantly and we value the land at that potentially uh, uh, soon to be much more valuable land. In this case, I don't think it's 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 fair or legitimate. I think the building is the building, and the fact that there uh, there's activity going in the background that make it more valuable sometime in the future that we don't know about because it's not completely baked um, is not appropriate. Uh, I wanted to get a little context because I I buzzed around this building for many years as a uh, a leasing agent. And it's it's relevant. I don't know how important it is to know that this is one of the few buildings in Arlington that will accept short-term leases for at least the last 10 years, probably longer. This whole redevelopment process 
has been bubbling and the landlord has routinely, and I've seen it before, this is not inappropriate, I'm certainly not criticizing, has routinely uh, accepted a, uh, you know, Mr. Harmon said seven year lease, I hear a three or five year lease, but there's always a caveat on, in there that at some date certain, usually about 18 months out or so, the landlord has the right with adequate notice to stop the lease because the redevelopment, physical redevelopment would have started. And this is a shaggy dog story. It's been going on for a while. So the fact that um, that rents are low relative to the rest of Roslyn is true for all the reasons that the appellant said, and also because tenants run the risk of being asked to leave before they thought their lease protected them. Um, so all these numbers, to me, make a lot of sense um, uh, by avoiding um, I'm just writing my notes. Oh, and, and, and that includes, for instance, which is our, our, our standard, uh, one year um, lease up costs, um, in particular in this case. Although if somebody signed a five year lease and were asked to leave in a year and a half, the, the landlord still would have paid the five years worth of real estate commissions. But again, a lot of these are very short term leases. And, 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 and that's one of the reasons why the vacancy has been, been relatively high for such a long time, because a lot of people want to be stable, um, um, office users, they don't want to, to bounce around. So I'm, that's a long way of saying I'm, I'm, I, I think the test column is a very good representation. Okay, other folks? Mr. Panaranda? Yes, uh, I agree pretty much with the um, summarized uh, statement, I guess, as far as the test column being used. The only thing I was questioning is, the, are, is anyone in agreement that the expenses are OK, or are they uh, low compared to 19? Or because I thought normally nine, year 19 is going to be a good reflection, and then we see 2020 coming to be a little more than that, but in this case, it's lower. Go ahead, Ken. Well, we, I personally raised this even last week after hearing the answer to that a couple of times, but finally it's gotten through my dura. And that is that we're comparing not the um, stabilized uh, gross potential income, but rather a stabilized uh, EGI, whatever that stands for. Um, uh, what, what's the E for? I'm sorry. Effective gross income. And, 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 which includes some vacancy, in this case 25%, vacancy allowance. So we are, uh, and this goes directly to what the appellant had said, you know, if you have a stabilized income, why don't you have stabilized, 100% um, stabilized operating expenses? And the answer is we're not comparing it to stabilized 100% income, but rather the adjusted for vacancy income, and that, that's what regularizes it and makes it sane. It took me a while during the presentation to remember that from last week. Did, was that responsive, Jose, or did I go off on a Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Mr. Jose, Gates. Uh, Jose, I, I would have looked at it the same way a little bit, but I do, I'm more with where Ken is that as opposed to the appellant's numbers, there's the development value. And I think the test column even kind of balances as the, the overall value out of what this is worth. Mm -hmm. I, I, so the actual numbers, you kind of lose them in the in the analysis. It it's really goes to what this is worth now as a development effort. Mm -hmm. right. um, okay. Yeah. Mr. Lawson? Uh, yes, um, um, I, I think that's a good point that was just made. Um, you know, this isn't a situation where it's zone CO and its office and the owner decides, OK, we're going to raise it and we're going to amend the site plan and now we're going to go residential. And we're going to get a, a 4.8 FAR. We're going to go up uh, one FAR. I mean, this is a case where you're going from 3.8 to 10. And, um, you know, that's a lot of density and it's not it, it, you know, we don't know the cost of that yet. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like. It has to be designed. 
you have to go through a, about a million to a million five hundred thousand dollar process to get that established but still you're going i mean you're going up a six far and that's huge so that that's why i'm, I'm comfortable uh with the county figures that's great Okay, it sounds like um, everybody's on the test. So anything contrary, Ms. Hogan? No? Okay, then would somebody like to make a motion? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and move that we reduce the assessment to the revised numbers at 23,961,300. I'll second. Okay, a motion and a second by Mr. Yates. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it's unanimous. Um, it's reduced to the county's um, revised number of 23,961,300. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chairwoman, uh, just for um, my records, I couldn't see everybody. Was that a unanimous vote? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, and um, all the players remain the same for the final case on the agenda. RPC 17001010. The property is located at 1100 Wilson Boulevard. Mr. Harmon, you can start with your eight minutes and tell us about this property, sir. Yes, thank you. So this property also in Roslyn, it's, as you said, 1100 Wilson Boulevard. It's between uh, Wilson and Lynn Street. It was built in 1985. This is one of the two half moon shaped buildings on the Roslyn skyline. Now, if you'd be so kind as to direct your attention to page four of the appeal pack, this is the county's test page. Please note that the value in the county's test column represents a 7.4% increase over the 2020 assessment. You can see in columns C and E that the actual NOI reported at the property decreased by 1.3% from 2019 to 2020, yet the assessed NOI increased by 8.3%. This property has been chronically vacant over the past four years. The year end vacancy was 32% in 2017, 31% in 2018, and 28% each of the past two years. You'll also note on the test page that we believe the rental rate assumed by the assessment for both leased and vacant office space is overstated and that the operating expenses are understated. For the leased office rental rate, we believe the best indication of value is the base rate less 8% for concessions. This is based on five new leases being signed in 2020, which had a weighted average of 11% concessions. As I previously mentioned, this property has weathered significant vacancy over the past four years, and this rate of concessions is likely necessary to attract and maintain tenants. Updating the leased office space to reflect the reality of the leasing environment and the 11% concessions in 2020 uh, at the property. This reduces the leased office income by about 500,000 from the county's test column. We, we used 8%, not the 11. We feel that is fair. Uh, for the vacant office rental rate, again, we have five leases that began in 2020. And if you would direct your attention to page six of the appeal, this is the county's rent roll. The tenants highlighted in green are the 2020 new office leases. Now there is an error. One of these leases should not have been included as it was a 2019 lease. So the initial Academy apparent lease is from 2019. So if we remove that from the 2020 lease calculation, uh, we'll, we'll analyze the remaining five and we find that concessions are at a weighted average of 11%. The weighted average rent on these new leases listed on the county's rent roll, again, after removing the 2019 Academy parent lease, was $48.16 per square foot, which works out to a net effective rent of $42.86 per square foot. Using $42.86 per square foot, based on these five new leases in 2020, results in vacant office income decreasing by nearly 300,000 from the county's test column. Finally, the operating expenses at the property, which again has been at least 28% vacant, for each of the past four years have averaged $11.36 per square foot. Now this figure does include leasing commissions, which at a property facing chronic vacancy, such as a subject, seeing these recurring charges year after year, 
it's important to consider these substantial costs as expenses uh, since they will project forward and, and project to be continued in years going forward. So to summarize, this property again has operated at high vacancy for at least the past four years. The actual NOI at the property has decreased from 2019 to 2020 by 1.3%, yet the assessed NOI increased by 8.3%, and the assessed value increased by 7.4%. The occupancy barely changed from the 2019 to the 2020 INE rent roll. It was just under 380,000 square feet in both years. Uh, the assessment assumes an, the office leased space rental rate increased by $4.50 per square foot from the 2020 assessment. In fact, actual rents in place only increased by $1 per square foot. The five new office leases in 2020 support both a lower occupied office and a lower vacant office rental rate because they required a weighted average 11% concession rate. Finally, the actual and stabilized operating expenses at the property support a higher operating expense rate. Thank you, and Eileen, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Peralta for the county, please. Turn your microphone on, please. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to remind the board, um, as with the last case, in this case, in years 2017 to 2020, the actual income of this property was reported in uh, row one of uh, the office um, income. So when um, Mr. Harmon speaks to the NOI decreasing over the years, that's not I mean, that's that's what they're reporting. But then when you actually look at the gross potential for this property, you'll see that it's been increasing over time. As you see from 2018 to 2020, you'll see the figures there for the gross potential income row number seven increasing over time. Um, when looking at this property again, um, they're reporting the actual income. So when you're looking at the test and the pro forma, you'll see that the gross potential that both the appellant and myself in our test column have shown an increase um, over time, an increase um, compared to what uh, you see as the actual income reported for this property. In addition to that, um, what you see, <clears throat> as Ms., uh, Mr. Harmon pointed out, the new leases on page um, page six of the rent roll, um, what I indicated there in red is th these leases have um, commenced, I believe, uh, May of 2020. And with such, um, they're not reporting the extra income, the um, operating costs or real estate tax um, that they're paying. And so that that figure should be included as well or, or considered if we were to look at this property as stabilized, as a gross potential property, um, as the department has asked that they report in the 2020 INE. So when you're looking at this this figure, this column E, um, just keep that in mind because what this is not including is that 147,885 square feet of potential income. And you'll see that that's included in both the appellant's uh, column and the test column. And we differ um, by about four or five dollars uh, per square foot uh, based on that square footage that is vacant. Um, but as you see, again, when, when we analyze this um, this property as well as the other properties in the county, we take the uh, the rent roll that is provided. We analyze it. We do break it down. Um, Mr. Harmon did state that Academy parent shouldn't be included, but the two um, the expansion space and the original space bo are both at the $46. Um, I'm sorry, at, at the same rate as um, as shown in my rent roll. So it shouldn't change that um, that 2020 projection for the, the new leases that were commenced of as of May 2020 of this year. Um, 
the other point or the other point that the uh, appellant had brought out was the expenses again. When looking at the expenses, um, we did increase those expenses, um, you know, given what they reported in the past. Uh, as you see there, um, we're about maybe $2 more than what they've reported, and even the most recent INE suggests that there's a lower expense rate there. And I understand that, you know, there's um, some vacant square feet that are um, may project higher if those uh, tenants were in place, but um, believe that $10 is more accurate versus um, what the appellant is saying at $11.36. That hasn't been shown in previous history at all and so um, when looking at this property again when you compare the nois of the history please keep in mind those nois do not um, include some of the potential rent that could have been captured or or shown i should say um, in particular when you look at 2020 um, there is concessions of about um, on row row 10, there's uh, concessions of over $202 million that include those tenants that have just signed in 2019-2020, yet there is no potential rent that is um, being reported. So to me, it's, it's actual income minus the concessions of the potential rent. Uh, of the actual rent versus the potential rent that you see in uh, column F. Um, Irving, did you have anything before we finish? Um, just like in the last case, I just want to point out again, since the discussion is about stabilized expenses. Uh, 2019 vacancy was 27%. Expenses came in at $9 a square foot. Um, our test and original assessment we're using a 25 percent vacancy and a ten dollars a square foot expenses so we're using higher expense rates than a comparable year i'm not even going to really include 2020 because that was a 28 percent vacancy and they reported eight dollars and 58 cents a square foot for expenses but i mean some of the expenses could be low due to COVID. but 2019 was before COVID, and it's close to the vacancy rate that we use um, again, 27% vacancy, we're using 25% vacancy and a dollar higher on expenses. Um, as far as leasing commissions, I mean, that keeps being mentioned, but again, it's about if you don't deduct leasing commission, that's an expense. When you formulate your capitalization rate, then you don't turn around and deduct that as an expense when you value your property. So we continue to say that it's inappropriate to include the leasing commissions in this situation. Because when you formulate your cap rate, you're not using leasing commissions as an expense. Uh, we do account for that in our below the line deductions due to the higher vacancy. But as far as above the line expenses, the ten dollars is more than appropriate based off the history of the property. Thank you. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, questions from board members. Mr. Matzkin. For the department, um, it's why didn't we split out office versus retail? I mean, this certainly isn't in a special classification like 46 South Glee because the cap rates are different. Um, usually that's reserved for um, spaces that are larger than the total square footage of the property. So uh, I believe it's, is it 15% there, Irving? No, we, we just don't do it at all on office properties. Uh, the, the reason we do it on apartments, um, if you don't recall it, in like years ago, on apartments, we used a single cap rate. Um, it was after discussion about the different tax rate applied to commercial space, we began to use the commercial cap rate on those apartment buildings. Uh, when you look at the uh office building again like rob said the square footage of retail is small it's about 17,000 square feet on this 500,000 square foot building um again the retail gets the office cap rate of 
25% instead of the general commercial cap rate of 4%. So there are a lot of different offsets there. Yeah, yeah we just value this one property basically. Yeah, the sales that we've seen don't separate it out either. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. The, the, you've answered this before. I, I apologize. It's the key word is apartments. Okay, other questions? No? Okay, Mr. Peralta, if you take a minute to wrap up, sir. Yes. Um, for this property, uh, again, we treat this property the exact same as the other properties and upon review. Um, we're looking at the rent roll. The rent rates that we have included in the test column are exactly what we've seen um, in this particular subject property. We do reduce the or increase the vacant square footage to what they reported in 2020 actually decreased. Uh, I'm sorry. The original assessment, we had a higher um, vacancy uh, square footage than what we're testing here. Um, we do ask that the, the new value that we did test uh, based on the most recent information be um, be approved. And um, again, uh, just to reiterate the expenses that we proposed, the $10 are more than what was um, seen in the history of this property. And we also allow uh, a excess vacancy allowance for the vacant square footage as well. Um, thank you. OK, thank you, Mr. Harmon. If you take a minute to wrap up, sir. Actually, I'm going to just take a quick second um, okay. and then Mr. Harmon will finish. I just want to point out two things that were said by the county that are incorrect. One is that the concessions are deducted twice. That is not correct. I have confirmed that with the owner. The income and expense survey form state that concessions on page uh, 96 state that concessions are not included or deducted on lines I01 or 10. And so that is just a false statement. And we have confirmed that with almost all of the owners. The other thing is, is Mr. Peralta continues to fail to understand that there is no pass-through income in an initial year of a lease. There is no pass-through. The base year is being established. Those expenses are included in the base rent. Mr. Harmon, please finish. You need to turn your mic on. Thank you, Eileen. I'd also like to point out that for the vacant office rental rate, if we use the same methodology as the county on there, I believe it's page six, um, and we use actual concessions and not the standard 6%, we get to $42.86 for the vacant office rental rate. If we, and that's not including the 2019 Academy parent lease. If we do include that 2019 Academy parent lease, it actually skews that number down to forty-two dollars forty-three cents. So, you know, we were we were excluding that out of, out of just trying to be above board and, and keep it consistent. But it does if we do include that, it does work in the appellant's favor to get the uh, twenty the vacant office rental rate down to forty-two dollars forty-three cents based on using actual concessions uh, incurred to get the secure those leases. Um, additionally, the actual numbers were reported on the INEs. This is because projecting and certifying rents that do not exist is difficult. You know, it, it's something that is not something that clients are, are want to do. So we do report, the clients do typically report actual income. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's just among the board members. What's everybody <laughs> Mr. Lawson. Um, yeah, let me throw a thought out there and uh, see if anyone salutes. Um, I'd be interested in uh, what, you know, um, what Mr. Matson thinks. Um, I was kind of trying to look up some stuff uh, while this was going on. Um, first of all, I'll talk about the uh, CO Roslyn. Um, this is in the plan, but it, nothing's come forward. So, you know, that's the comp plan or the general land use plan, which at this point is speculative and should not be um, included. Um, and the, 
in listening to all this, the one thought I had was, you know, uh, that I think the applicant may be correct that we should allow two years for lease up rather than one year. And, you know, it seems like this is just pure office. It's Rosalind. People are working at home. Um, you may actually have tenants wanting less space, uh, which is opposite. And so, um, you know, the one thought I had was to reduce the the, uh, the assessed value uh, by allowing a longer period to lease out. I came up with uh, 235, 326, uh, 900 by adding, by, by uh, putting in the two years and using the uh, property owner's um, um, figure of the 1,336,672, and I'll see if uh, anybody agrees with that. Okay, other folks? Mr. Panoranda. Um, I think in this particular case, I think both parties have agreed that only one year should be used. Uh, I know Ms. Borman also mentioned that. But all, to the last point that uh, Mr. Harmon made, as far as the vacant space, um, I think that's pretty much the difference, in my opinion, in this case. Uh, there's a difference of about $5 between what they're asking, you know. And I thought when I did the numbers myself, I thought the $42 rate on vacant space was more appropriate. So if any adjustment were to be made to the assessment, I think it would be more in line to that particular uh, number instead of just uh, going to a two-year allowance. Uh, so, I mean, we haven't done it with any case. I don't think we should start. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, repeat run, what you thought I'm might sorry, change. Hold on, hold on one second. Did you run the number, Jose, at the $42 on the vacant? 42. Uh, I did. <clears throat> Let me see. Using the $42 on vacant space, I'm just going to summarize the numbers. Uh, the NOI that I come up with is sixteen million one eighty three uh, ten dollars. So the final value after deductions, and also making the adjustment on the deduction for the forty two dollar rate, comes to two hundred thirty one million five seventeen one thirty six, which is lower than you know instant value. Okay, Mr. Yates. I went a little deeper and I went with the appellant's real rate numbers. Uh, anyway, I brought it down uh, and then I used the county's expense number, which I think is correct. But I came out with a uh, the indicated total value of 224,758, which is a little lower than Jose's. I did not run all. Just 231, that's not a little lower. That's quite a difference. Well, yeah, but I I think the issue really comes down to how you're looking at those, those rail rates. Okay, all right, Mr. Maskin, you worked, you had a comment? I, I, I'm, I was troubled that this building for good, bad, or indifferent is very stabilized and that the <clears throat> excuse me, the assessment is going up 7.4%. So I kept scouring the numbers to find out if there was anything that didn't add up or assumptions weren't weren't uh, completely uh, on target. And I came up pretty much where Jose came up, that, that the vacant space uh, ought to come down some. Should come down to 39? Probably not, because then there'd be full double counting of the concessions that were provided as rolled into the vacancy in concessions 25 percent off so <coughs> excuse me so um, I, I was more comfortable with that could i find another million dollars of assessment i guess but it's speculation and and, and we should be proof when doing that but um, that's why i'm not as extreme as as, as mark has come out and, and, and more aligned with jose's calculation and rationale okay yeah, that, that's pretty much a difference of about 417,000 in GPI. So, and I didn't really, I, I thought also about the expenses, but I think I'm okay with the expenses at $10. Mm -hmm. All right, 
Right, because I, I think the ten dollar the number is certainly stabilized over what's been it's a generous number. It's yeah, I could live with that. I mean, all right. So, um, Mary, Miss Hogan, I'm Mary, good. I'm good with that ice number. All right, I don't see Mr. Hoffman. Yeah, my video is not working. Can you hear oh. me? I can hear you. Yes. Where are okay, you? On? Yes. Everybody's frozen on my screen, but uh, I can hear everything that's being said. I'm OK with Jose's number as well. OK, All right. and you've got more than enough votes there. So OK, then I'll, I'll move that we reduce the assessment to 231 million 517 100 based on increasing the vacant and by changing the vacant space from the revised assessment to $42. OK, and Ms. Hogan is a second uh, motion, a second on this to reduce all in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. OK, so it's unanimous. It's reduced to two hundred and thirty one million five seventeen one hundred even. And that was adjusting the vacant space on the revised the county's test column to forty two dollars a square foot. Yeah, uh, let me correct. It's two hundred two hundred thirty one five seventeen one hundred. That's what I said. I thought. Oh, you said uh, 231, 517 even. Mm. OK, no, 231, mm -hmm. 517, 100. Thank you. That's what I wrote. Thank you. Thank you, board. Thank you, board. Okay. Rob, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Eileen. And Irvin. Have a good evening, board. You too. OK, um, that completes the agenda. Does anybody have any business? Either Kerry or. Board members? No? No. Okay, then we will stand adjourned at 10-12 and re-adjourn tomorrow, Wednesday, September 15th at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. All right, Rosa, just let us know.